Kia ora koutou, nau mai haere mai ki tēnei hui. My name's Joanne Dow, ko Joanne Dow, toko ingoa, and I am Principal Engagement Advisor at Manaki Whenua. Um, thank you all for being here today. You'll have read a little bit about the, the subject. Um, what's new for us today is being on the Teams platform. Um, it seems pretty simple so far, but please, um, if there are any difficulties, bear with us, we're, we're still learning. Uh, so we're all here to talk about or to listen to a talk about wallabies as, as you'll have read in the invitation this is a serious pest problem in New Zealand um, these cute furry looking creatures from across the ditch are unfortunately becoming a real uh, uh, pest and causing damage to to our productive sector and also to to New Zealand's conservation and restoration efforts we've got about 21 projects either recently completed or underway on wallabies at Manaki Whenua Land Care Research. Um, and among the researchers working on, on those projects are Drs. Bruce Warburton and Graham Hickling. Dr. Graham Hickling. Um, both Bruce and Graham are senior researchers in our wildlife ecology and management team. And between the two of them, they have over 75 years of research experience in ecology and animal control. So we've got a fabulous wealth of, of knowledge and experience here with us today. Um, so perfect people to hear from. They'll be talking about some of the research that's ongoing. And wallabies is the theme of our latest uh, Putaiao um, newsletter, which is available on our website. So if you still have more questions unanswered at the end, um, then you can go and have a have a read of that as well. But without further ado, I will hand over to Bruce to kick us off and, and Graham will pick up. And I'll be back at the end to answer questions. Remember to pop the questions in the Q&A function as soon as they occur to you so that we can get rolling as soon as um, the presenters have finished. All right, over to you, Bruce. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Joanne and kia ora koutou. Um, Thank you all for joining uh, the seminar this morning. So I'm Bruce Warburton and I'm going to start with just some background information and then Graham's going to follow that with um, an overview of, of a project that he's been involved in and then I'll finish off with one of my projects. So many people in New Zealand don't know we have wallabies and even those ones that do um, don't know how many species we have. So yes, we do have wallabies, and in fact, we have um, five species. So there's four species on Kauwara Island, the brush tail rock wallaby, uh, the swamp wallaby, dharma wallaby, and palmer wallaby. And these species were introduced by Sir George Grey, the first governor of New Zealand back in about 1870. The Dharma wallaby was um, translocated from Kauwea Island um, to Rotorua about the same time. Um, and up until about 18 months ago, it was thought that Dharma were the only species at Rotorua, but Andrew Veal, a colleague here at Manaki Whenua, um, did some DNA analysis and he confirmed that were Palmer um, present in the Rotorua area as well. And we're not quite sure how we uh, they got there, but we have our suspicions and we can talk about that um, later on. The brush tail rock wallabies um, were also on Rangitoto Island and Motutapu Island in the Hauraki Gulf. Um, but Department of Conservation had a successful eradication program in the early 1990s and eradicated that species from those two islands. And then down in the South Island, Bennett's wallabies, um, which came from Tasmania, were introduced into South Canterbury. Just in terms of size, the Dharma Palmer uh, weigh about three or four, maybe five um, kilograms. The swamp wallaby is around 12 to 15 kilograms. And the Bennett's wallaby, the one down the bottom of the, the slide there, they can get up to about 25 kilograms. So it's a, it's the largest of, of the wallaby species. So a bit more detail of, of where they are. So on the left are the Bennett's wallabies in the um, South Island. So you can see Timaru there, Christchurch to orientate yourself. 
And the liberation point was at Te Waimati Station, just um, near Waimati, just here. And you can see the historical spread um, of, of Bennett's as, as they established and, and spread. Um, the black line that you can see around here is the containment area boundary, and that's defined within ECAN's Regional Pest Management Plan. And you can see that there's lots of sightings and some um, shot animals outside that containment area, and we'll talk about that in a slide or two. And those wallabies are now spreading south into Otago, and several have been sighted and shot north of that containment area as well. And similarly for Dharma, the black um, area, the line there is again their containment area defined in their regional pest management plan. And again with the Dharma, you can see um, as many sightings outside those containment areas or that containment area. Now that um, historical spread, that that rate of spread could be used to forecast um, what the populations might do if we don't do any control. And Cecilia Latham, another colleague at Manaki Whenua, um, did some predicted future distributions in 2015-16. Uh, and you can see here for both areas, if we don't do anything by 2065, the distribution of these wallabies um, will be a lot greater um, than they are now. So that, so that is a concern, of course. And they do have an impact. So, you know, why should we be concerned about them? So they have biodiversity impacts. Um, they eat understory um, in our indigenous forests, so change the composition of our forests. And that affects ecosystem services, and they have impact on production. Um, values as well, livestock and forestry. Um, that bottom, bottom picture there is a thermal night vision photo from a, a farm paddock uh, near Rotorua, so they're Dharma wallabies. So with this spread, an ongoing spread in, in the distribution and increasing impacts, uh, MPI, Ministry for Primary Industries, developed a business case and a strategy and submitted that to um, Treasury. I think it was in 2021. And they were successful in, in getting funding to establish the National Wallaby Eradication Program, uh, Tipu Matoro. So the objective of that program is by 2025, wallabies are contained within designated containment areas that's those the black lines that I showed in a previous slide. And this is to involve eliminating those outlier populations and reducing the wallaby numbers within buffer areas just inside those containment boundaries. And to help do this, achieve this, developing innovation in wallaby detection and control methods. And that's where the research comes in. So the program, MPI's program, has funded a, a whole range of projects and, and as Joanne uh, mentioned, some of them are ongoing, but there's quite a lot of them completed. And of the completed ones, there are contract reports available and some of them have been published. And, um, so if, I'm not going to go through them in detail. If any of them sort of catch your eye, please get in touch and we can forward you the, um, the contract reports or papers. But two that we're just going to focus on today, um, they haven't been selected for any real reason, logical reason, but Graham's going to talk about bait delivery systems that he's been working on, and I'll finish off um, talking about a pilot um, study that we have on translocation of Bennett's wallabies. So I'll hand it over to Graham. Thank you, Bruce. Kia ora koutou. So wallabies have been controlled both in the North and South Island for many years. Uh, landowners would often use night shooting and when large areas need control, there's been techniques for sowing toxic bait from aircraft, which can be very effective. But there are areas where neither shooting nor aerial control is appropriate. And so there's been a lot of interest in using the kinds of bait feeders that you can see in these photos. 
Um, so a bait feeder provides the advantage of you can put out larger amounts of bait and it's protected from the weather. You can bring the feeder in uh, at the end of a control operation. So any unused bait isn't a, a risk to livestock or other non-target species. And there's been interest in perhaps, you know, transects of bait stations around the boundaries of the containment areas that Bruce talked about might be a way to stop or, uh, you know, catch animals that are trying to leave the areas. And bait feeders have been a very effective, you know, long-standing technique for possums, but there's been recognition that they just don't seem to work as well for wallabies. And one of the reasons for that, you can see in this photo, uh, possums are very adept at using their forepaws to reach into feeders. They'll pull bait out. The, if the feeder gets clogged, they'll rummage around and get the flow going again. And in contrast, wallabies almost never do that. They almost always take the bait um, just with their mouth. And so that and uh, other kind of behavioral differences are, are what we were trying to have a look at with the objective of can we make recommendations for, for better, more effective designs of bait feeders? Next slide, please. And so the first of the two trials I'll talk about uh, is shown here. It was looking at existing designs of feeders and simply the behavior of wallabies when they're attracted to them with non-toxic bait. And so the first two feeders in those photographs are the typical kind of enclosed plastic feeder. The, uh, there's a, we call it the Marley hockey stick, and then there's a modified version of the fill proof. And then the other two use strikers. And what strikers are is a cereal bait that's encased in a waxy coating. And so that's an alternative way to get weatherproofing rather than having to put them into a plastic container. And so we had these two striker uh, deployments, one raised up on a tomato steak and, and the other flat on the ground. Next slide. Uh, so we did this both for Dharma wallabies up in the Rotorua area, and that work was all done by Tim Day and his crew. So we uh, appreciated that that help. And then we sent Manaki Fenua field staff down into South Canterbury into Bennett's wallaby habitat. And so in both of these areas, we had replicates of uh, you know, five or six of each of these feeder types spread along transects. And we watched them for eight to 10 weeks. Next slide. And the way we watched is with uh, night vision capable trail cams that uh, they'll have a daylight mode and then they'll switch to um, infrared illumination at night. And so each site had a couple of these cameras and the behavior at the bait feeders was compared with this layout, which is kind of a non-treatment, just putting bait, simply putting bait on the ground. Next slide. Uh, so we started off wondering how many photos we would get, and we got a lot. Uh, we got just under 2 million images in South Canterbury and just over 2 million in the Rotorua area. Uh, which is obviously a huge challenge to analyze. And so the first step of processing all of this was to run it through a, an in-house AI uh, software that we used. And, and the way that AI works is uh, the first pass through, it takes out all the images that don't have any animals. And so that's waving tussocks, uh, branches in the sunlight and so on. And because both of these areas, you know, had a lot of that, that actually cut, cut the number of images down by about 90%. It then had a go at doing species ID of the animal photos. Um, it was relatively good at that, but not perfect. And so we, we manually checked. So here's examples of the kinds of uh, wallaby photos we got. We would get you know, considerable numbers of wallabies uh, feeding at all the different feeder designs. Next slide. And there was a range of other species, uh, pr predominantly possums. So we saw a lot of possums, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Uh, but you can see upper right, there's a pig. Lower right, there's a stoat that's climbed up one of the strikers. Uh, we also saw hedgehogs up in the North Island. We saw a lot of rats. But uh, the dominant two species we saw were wallabies and possums. And the possum part of the story is interesting. Next slide. E oh, sorry, jumped ahead. Um, so First thing to talk about is how did the feeder designs compare? So when a wallaby came to a feeder, 
did it actually use it? Did it feed at it? That's what these graphs are showing, the percent feeding. And you can see that the ground strikers and the raised strikers uh, were well accepted, essentially the same amount of feeding there as you would get with pellets on the ground. But the marlies and the fill proofs um, were not well accepted. And what we think is going on there is that wallabies are just a high strung, nervous, vigilant species. They really don't like putting their head into an enclosed space because it blocks their vision and to some extent their hearing. And, and they just are quite averse to doing that. And so one of the take home messages from this trial was that in terms of feeder design, anything that's an enclosed feeder, putting your head into it is not going to work well for wallabies. Next slide. The second outcome uh, relates back to the possum story. And so I, can you just click the video, Bruce? Um, so here we see a, you know, a happy wallaby feeding away, uh, but the next minute a possum arrives and the possums are really aggressive and very socially dominant over wallabies, even though they have smaller body size. And so we saw a lot of wallaby possum interactions and in every single one of them, the possum won. And so there's a couple of issues there. The possums can drain the feeders before the wallabies get a chance to feed. Also, if the wallaby's there first, the possums can interrupt the feeding bout. And if it was a toxic bait, then you get the risk of sublethal dosing and bait shyness. Next slide, please. That possum effect, um, the possum doesn't even have to be alive. And so here we've got, um, just as a, a little side trial we did, what happens when there's a dead possum, if we imagine the possum had been you know, killed by a toxic bait lying at a feeder. Next, uh, just click please, Bruce. And here's a graph of this is the number of uh, visits that uh, wallabies were making. And you can see that once that carcass was placed during the first week, wallaby visits dropped off by about 80% of that feeder, but it wasn't a long lasting effect. This was done in summer, it was warm, there were lots of flies um, scavenging and so on. And so although it's a concern for management, um, it doesn't tend to be a long lasting effect because you can see by week two, basically that carcass is boiled down to something that's unrecognizable. And at that point, the, the wallaby usage started picking up again. Next slide. So based on the results of that first trial, we then ran a second trial where we kind of tried to take some of those learnings and say, okay, maybe we can design a better bait feeder. We did a couple of different new designs, but this is one example. And so what we were going for here is something that's much more open, that doesn't, you know, it's see through, the animal doesn't have to put its head into something that's fully enclosed. And we're also in this case, trying to combine both strikers and a, a tray of the cereal bait. So we called this the multi-feeder. Um, and in this trial, we were pulsing toxic bait through. And part of the objective there was, you know, if possums are coming, maybe the first animals that come, the first possums that come get killed, and that would then free up the feeder for later visits by the wallabies. And so the sort of the measure here was uh, rather than visits, this was how many we actually managed to kill. So here's the results from that trial from down south. South Canterbury with Bennett's wallabies, and, and basically um, our design was no good or not very good. Uh, so the raised striker, which was just the comparison that we made to, you know, that that had worked fine in the first trial, the raised striker still worked better. So that was the result for the South Island. Next slide. A bit different in the North Island. Up in the North Island, there were a lot more possums coming, and the problem there was that the possums would consistently get to the strikers first. They would tend to take them. And so when the wallabies finally turned up, there was no toxic bait left and most of them didn't get killed. And so that advantage of the raised striker tends to dissi dissipate when you don't, when you, when you have a lot of wallabies, because in that situation, the fact that the multi feed is deploying a lot more bait is helpful because even if the possums come first, when they leave, there's still some, bait left for the wallabies that arrive later. But the other point here is, you know, if you look at the kills there, that's one or two wallabies being killed per week per station. And so I'll talk about that in a second. Next slide. So to wrap up, 
what have, what what have we learned? First point is bait station designs need to avoid restricting wallabies' vision and hearing, and also the placement of the stations needs to avoid that. And what I'm getting at there is a bait station that's attached to a broad tree trunk on a bush edge is essentially cutting out half of the field of view of the wallaby, and they don't like that. Whereas a striker out in the open maintains a 360 degree view, and I think is a is a better placement for a bait feeder. The second point is that possum activity is a huge issue in terms of getting effective bait station controller wallabies. Uh, there's a photo up the top right there of Tim Day with um, a feeder that's killed 12 possums and hasn't killed a wallaby. And Tim actually told me about another field site he worked at, a, uh, a much larger area where they had about 500 feeders out. He said they killed 900 possums in their feeders or with their feeders before they got their first wallaby. So if possums are in the area, they have to be dealt with, and that's going to be a substantial increase to the cost of, of these kinds of operations. And then finally, just the final point is that even when wallabies did come to the toxic bait feeders, a lot of them weren't being killed. So we had this quite low kill relative to the number of wallabies we actually saw at the feeders. Some of them didn't take the toxic bait. Others would take the bait up into their mouth, but then spit it out, uh, particularly the ferrotox pellets. And so that's going to be the focus of the, the next phase of this research is um, trying to get, uh, you know, if we can get the wallabies there, can we then effectively kill them? So perhaps more on that uh, a year from now. Thanks for listening. I'll pass back to Bruce. Thank, thanks, Graham. So I'm just going to run through a, a pilot trial um, we ran um, looking at the translocation of Bennett's wallabies, so again in South Canterbury. Um, and the reason was to determine, or well, what we wanted to determine was to know if Bennett's wallabies that are translocated into an area with no other wallabies do they stay at the release site or do they move away from it? So do they show a high fidelity to those release sites? And why? If wallabies are illegally released, and they are, um, and there is a reported sighting, is it worth a council investing resources into searching for them? Or you know, are they going to be will believe that those wallabies would have shifted by the time they go and search for them and they won't find them. And we had a, a research interest as well. We um, are interested in running some projects trying to determine the detection probability of various methods like thermal cameras on helicopters or drones or dogs. Um, and we need to know a number of wallabies. So can we release wallabies into an area and, and we'll know um, how many that we're actually looking for. But there was lots to learn um, from capturing. Now, fortunately, in the 1990s, New Zealand actually had quite an active live export of wallabies to around the world, to, to zoos and, and parks. And we were, we were able to capitalise on that experience. Um, there's a chap who lives in South Canterbury that, that um, was involved in that um, live export trade and we were able to use him for live capturing animals and he used um, tunnel nets you can see him setting a tunnel net up in the photos there and a wallaby entering one of those nets so it was just a pilot trial and we captured three males and three females and then brought them back to lincoln to our animal facilities and the vets also had to learn because they hadn't done any surgery on wallabies um, so after they were acclimatised in our um, animal facility, the vets um, vasectomised the, the males and carried out ovarectomies on the females. Because when we release these wallabies into areas where there's currently no wallabies, the last thing we wanted to do was to establish a new population. We fitted satellite collars to these animals and they took GPS fixes every two hours and uploaded via satellite every 12 hours. So daily we, we got an update of where these animals um, were and yeah, we, um, yeah, and we, we could track where, 
whether they stayed put or whether they shifted. So the photo in the bottom middle there is the, the, six, the six wallabies there. They're all anaesthetised and getting the collars fitted. And you can see the GPS collar on the bottom right there. So where did we release them? There was a pair, though they were liberated as male-female pairs in, in April last year. Um, one site was near Lake Heron. Um, so if you're not sure where that is, um, hopefully most of you will know where Mount Hutt is. So it's sort of southwest of Mount Hutt. And then there was two um, released in the Ida Valley and two on Patiaro Station. So again, that's just sort of south or southwest of Ranfurly in the Maniatoto. So though those two areas are in Otago. Now, because it was a pilot trial, it was only meant to run for two months. Um, but and, and at the end of the two months, we were meant to track the animals down and shoot them because the councils didn't want these um, animals reported that they then had to go and look for. Um, but th that proved quite a challenge. So we ended up leaving them for five months. And, and this is the, the home ranges or their movements over that five month period. Um, and they stayed pretty well where they were released with one or two exceptions there. So B4, the one in the middle there, um, I've expanded that out to the right. Um, it was released at that black triangle. And in the first two days, it, it moved up over about 1500 metres into the, the catchment to the, to the west, um, southwest there, which is the Cameron Valley. And it stayed there for quite a while. So those blue dots and then it made a shift um, down to the area where there's the, the yellow lines and yellow dots. So most of them stayed stayed put really and didn't really move. Now after, so at the end of five months we shot, we tracked two, two wallabies um, and, sh and shot them. So there was four left and they took another few months to, to try and recover. And in, in the interim, um, three of them decided they would start moving. And we think it might be a, a, a seasonal cue. We don't really know. So this is an animal that was released at Padero Station. So that's on the western side of the Rock and Puller Range. Um, and it headed, it headed north along the Rock and Puller Range, around the northern edge, and then back down towards Middle March. So it moved about 40 kilometres. Um, the other animal, or one of the animals at Lake Heron, it also moved 35 to 40 kilometres. And one of the animals at, at Ida Station moved about 20 kilometres. So just some summary results. The mean daily movements were mainly less than about two and a half kilometres. So they didn't move much around that core activity range. Their activity ranges did range from 200 hectares for the smallest up to 1,000 hectares. And that's a lot larger than the home ranges of resident animals within the containment area. Um, so Dave Latham published some work on that. Um, and the average home range of those resident animals was 25 hectares. The maximum shift was 40 kilometres. So all of them, so it's only six animals, stayed at or close to their release site for the first five to six months. And that was between April and October. And three of the remaining four shifted in spring and summer. So there's some tentative, and I'll um, reinforce it's only tentative, evidence that wallabies may stay at the release site during autumn, winter, but shift in spring and summer. So for councils, the take home message was, if they have a, a sighting reported in autumn and winter, it's probably worth investing and searching for it. But if it's spring and summer, unless they can respond immediately to that report, it may not be worth um, investing resources into it. It might be worth um, waiting until they get a second report and then trying to um, respond immediately to that subsequent report. So um, 
just a, a reminder to everyone that sees these signs and, and sees wallabies that you think are outside the containment area, areas, um, please report them on the Report Wallabies site. Um, and just before I finish off, just to acknowledge um, MPI, the Tipu Matoro um, program for funding this work. Um, the councils that were very supportive, um, several farmers there that, that provided access and many uh, Lankier Manaki Whenua staff who assisted with these projects. And Tim Day, Tim da uh, Day and the Bush uh, collaborators in the North Island that work with Graham. So thank you all and, and Graham and I are happy to um, answer any questions if we have time. Thank you. Kia ora thank you so much, um, Graham and Bruce. That was really, really interesting um, and great slides that you put together.